Thank you all so much for being here. I am honored that you are taking time to come out and learn on a Saturday, a fall Saturday in Iowa. Thank you for spending your time that way. Thank you, Pastor, for being willing to teach, to stand up, to tell the truth, to challenge your people, because we don't have enough pastors like that. The whole reason we're in the mess that we are in right now as a church, as a, as a, as a country, is because we as a church have not fulfilled our role. I travel and I get to stay in a lot of really neat places, some older places, and one time when I went to Ohio to talk about um, their babies being born already addicted to drugs because of prescription drugs being prescribed so easily, and in my hotel room I looked out and there were seven or eight beautiful old churches and cathedrals and I thought if you were doing your job your people wouldn't be hurting. And we can blame it all on the church, but there's even something more. If we were doing our job in our own house, as parents, as grandparents, that's our responsibility. I never, I never urged my kids to have grandkids. I wanted them to wait till they were ready. For, obviously, I was way too young anyway, right? But I wanted them to be ready because as much of fun as a grandbaby would be, and now that we have them, let me tell you, they are so much fun. I knew that that life, that soul, would someday stand before God on their own. And my kids are responsible for raising that soul and getting them there on their own. I used to say that our kids are the only thing we can take to heaven with us, and my husband would remind me and he'd say, no. We have to teach them to get there on their own. We don't take them with us. When we learn to get it right in our house, we'll get it right in God's house, and we'll get it right in the state house, the school house, the courthouse, and I think the jail house will be less full. But it rests with each of us. So I thank you, Pastor, for one, trusting me with this, for letting me go last. You can probably still come up and rebut anything I say out of line. I am politically active, and so I'm on full restraint right now. I want you all to know it. If I slip and I say anything, please just thank the Lord for the restraint I am showing. <laughs> I can't go to a Christmas party, and you shouldn't invite me one, because you're not supposed to talk about politics and religion. It's all I do. <laughs> I do Christian radio, and I do politics. We go on vacation. We were traveling in another city. I saw a billboard. It was about a social program, and I had a comment, and my daughter went, 15 minutes, Mom. You made it 15 minutes. <laughs> so the pastor's right. I'm going to try and draw for you. I don't win any Pictionary games. Remember when that was out? I don't win any Pictionary games. But I did this. Man, we were talking about on the way in. And my husband did such a great job today. Thank you so much, Lowell. You did such a good job. We were wondering when I drew this the first time, and we think it was 2006, maybe. So this has been around for a while. So we've heard some things about worldview, and Lowell gave you that great triangle, right? He's another great artist. We're just full of them in our family. <laughs> um, your worldview. How many of you wear sunglasses, and you come into the building, and then you can't see? It's like dark, right? That filter, that lens. Your beliefs, what happens to you, those personal experiences, how someone treated you, that's that filter on which you now see the world. That's your worldview, okay? Maybe intentional, maybe non-intentional, we don't even sometimes know. I disagree with the fact that people say you're all racist, you just don't know it. I so disagree with that. I so think that's an unfair judgment to make of anyone. And if we're not just supposed to judge others, why do they get by judging us? That's a hypocrisy when you get away from word and truth of the gospel. All right? So I'm going to start before we run out of time. There's a timer up there. Okay. I'm good. All right. So we're going to start right here. And I think you'll all know it. Can you see this color? Or should I get a darker color? Darker. If I had any skill with technology, they've got these iPads where you can draw and it goes up, and my daughter got it on my iPad just this morning. Here's the deal, I'm the one who goes to the Apple store to the, what is it, the Genius Bar? I stump the geniuses. 
We always hear, we've never seen this before. Okay, is that one better? Okay, tell me when you can tell what I'm writing. Now you all know what that one is, right? Right? Because the, uh, theism is the belief in God, atheism is the belief in no God, right? We also have agnostics now, which I think are even more concerning than atheists. Atheists don't believe there's a God. Agnostics, maybe, they don't care. How arrogant is that? Maybe there's a God who created the world. Eh, I don't care. Wow. Do you tremble for some people? I do, right? So if you're gonna be an atheist, then Genesis is a problem for you, right? Creation is a problem for you. Thus we have, tell me when you see it, and our kids are now being taught in school that Darwin is fact when we know it's just another theory, right? Used to at least taught creation, now we can no longer do that. I say teach them side by side. They're both theories, neither one can be exactly proven scientifically, but prove the, fault, the faults and the holes in this one and the things that have come to be with creation. There are more support for creation. As some people say, I don't have the faith to be an atheist or to believe in evolution. It takes a lot more faith in a leap. But when we get into evolution, it's, you know, and some people now we're seeing this, and I wanna talk about this. Some people are talking now about the Big Bang Theory. They're trying to warp or meld or twist the scriptures into fit with the world's idea of evolution. We as a church are so loving and kind that we wanna be accommodating, and too often we will twist whatever we're doing to fit to make it comfortable in the world. We need to stop that. We need to stop it. Because when we're not impacting the culture, they infect us. And we have a sick church in America. All right, so I'm gonna keep going here. Tell me when you see this one. Autonomous. So autonomous is kind of, you know, you're your own God. Because if you don't believe in him, you got to believe in evolution then. If you don't believe in evolution, you're really just kind of an animal. You're just kind of, well, you know, you're just your own thing, right? You're your godlike person. You'll perfect yourself. We hear that. Man's innately good. You hear politicians, politicians of all people saying that man's innately good. Really? Look around, right? Or that we're going to get better. We've heard about Marx and Stalin today. You all, how many here work in the nursery? Those kids are so good, aren't they? Always sharing, always giving. <laughs> Never have to teach them, right? They're by nature, we want what the other person has. By nature, our, our nature is what? Sinful. It's sinful, it's selfish. Okay, well then we come over here because this, this tells us that we're all powerful. We're, you know, we're godlike. Man can fix all our problems. <laughs> yeah, the experts, we need more of them. So if that's the case, then we get into, and you're hearing this term so much more anymore. And I guess for me, somebody who's fought this for decades, I'm half relieved it's now out in the open. Because used to when I talked about these things, people would call me names, which they still do, but they would talk about tinfoil hats, conspiracy theories, black helicopters, even my husband would say, honey, don't say that one publicly yet. Let's get some more research. Globalism, where they're trying now to create this one world government, you're hearing it? That we're not loving if we're not all together, right? So we'll come back and talk about that one a little bit more too. But when you get to the globalism, you know, it becomes all about, somebody's got a rule, who will it be? You come over here. Who's, who's, who's gonna be, whose idea? Because in the Middle East, they do things differently than we do here. I'm sorry, I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm right in front of it. I'm a great roadblock. The podium. Is that better for you? So amoralism. We get into amoralism 
Again, you know, we've got morals, but the amoralism kind of takes it without. You've got no absolutes, no right or wrong. Our son left, but when he was heading off to college, we wanted to send him to a worldview camp. Dr. David Noble, Summit Ministries, has anybody heard of that? At the base of Pikes Peak, takes kids for two weeks on their way out of high school before they get into college, takes them through the religious, um, education, um, uh, evolution, uh, sciences, economics, and he goes through a Christian worldview, a, a, a secular worldview, an atheist worldview, a communist worldview. And the idea is so when they get to college and they hear that professor talk, they can go, oh, he doesn't like capitalism. He's a socialist or he's a Marxist. And then they give them all the experts who come in and speak to them and they have a notebook when they leave with sources and resources when they have to write their papers. They've got information to support their theory. In a way, with, they tell them, don't do a frontal assault. Don't go after your teacher with a frontal assault. That's not really a good idea when they're gonna give you a grade. And so Blake did not wanna go. We made him go. It was the first time Blake ever really, like almost was rebellious with us. What if I don't wanna go? And what if I'm not happy I went? And then he said, what if I don't talk to you when I get back? And Lowell said, okay. <laughs> we took him and the whole way home, he chattered and everything he had learned about not doing this frontal assault. He got to Central College, two days on campus. He called and he goes, I don't think I'm gonna make it. The professor just said, you don't have to believe in Jesus Christ to be a Christian. The professor just said that there is no right or wrong, that there's no moral absolutes. We're like, Blake, remember that not frontal assault thing? So Blake raised his hand and said, so if somebody is abusing a two-year-old in the apartment next door, all right for them? The professor told him, we've, we've, we've heard enough, we're gonna move on. Central College, years ago. And, and by the way, the one who said you didn't have to believe in Jesus to be a Christian was a pastor in the town. Yeah. It all ties together, probably better than my artwork. But if you do this, no creator, then you have to have evolution. Random choice, it all happens by accident, right? We know this is not true. If you have a hurricane, which we just had here in Iowa, 2020 has been great, has it not? <laughs> if it were a scented candle, it would be, you fill in the blank. I like the one that says outhouse. <laughs> we had a dry land hurricane. If we'd had that hurricane over a junkyard, would all things rip together and form a 747? <laughs> just happened, big bang. The thermo, uh, what is it, second law of thermonuclear dynamics? What is that? Everything breaks down in time, right? It doesn't seem to just come together, does it? If you're on the beach and you see sand, you, you think, well, this could have happened randomly, but if you see the word help written in it, it kind of changes the picture, doesn't it? There is order to our universe. God counted the number of the stars. He named them. Our seasons are ordered. You look at the geometry in his designs, the rings of a tree, they are ordered. But they would rather think about random choice, the right to choose. You have your own power. You'll perfect yourself. Okay, let's come back to this for a minute. We're putting on this tape. So this is risky for me right here because as, when you're in the political field, I think you probably get as pastors too, but when you're in the political field, people will sometimes take what you say and twist it or use it against you however they can. I'm gonna say it anyway. If evolution, which we all know Darwin, remember his book, Survival of the, which is about what? The healthy survive, the weaker weaned out, and it's all a healthier system, correct? So if you're an evolutionist, Shouldn't COVID be your dream? Sorry, but shouldn't it? Isn't that just the way it is? I mean, you don't believe in God anyway. So you don't believe in heaven or earth. 
And it's the survival of the fittest, and the rest of you weak ones are causing us all to be, you know, lesser. You're bringing risk to our society. But they show their own hypocrisy. When you get away from the truth of the word, anything non-biblical, you will find hypocrisy. It, you can't help it. All right? Margaret Sanger, do you know who she is? Founder of Planned Parenthood. She believed in survival of the fittest. You've seen her quote, I wrote it down. And Snopes and everybody else wants to tell you how this wasn't quite what it was. We do not want word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population and the minister is the man who can straighten out the idea, if it ever occurs to any of them, of their more rebellious members. They used ministers to bring about the idea of abortion or birth control at that time. It was really to promote birth control. They used ministers. I bring this up because your ministers and your churches are being misused again today on a variety of topics. There are those who do nothing more than figure out how they can whittle and weed the Bible and the Word of God to fit their platform. You see, most of us, we would never be so bold to say there's no God. But we're quite comfortable making him the God we want. The God in a box that fits our plan for our life. All of a sudden, we have a loved one who's in a relationship that's not appropriate. We can justify it. We have somebody who's in a line of work that we know is not proper, ethical. We learn to ignore it. God is a God of justice. He cannot lie. And he cannot, he cannot let injustice stand. And my husband reminded me one time, when we sin... It's not sin against us, and we sometimes think about sin against those around us and offending those, but it is sin against an almighty God. We forget that. We forget that, even if nobody sees you. I mean, you know, you're in cameras. They, what they did, so the number of times that you're taken on camera today, I don't know what it was. It's amazing the number of times you're gonna see, be seen on video camera somewhere today. If you go get something to eat, you go to your bank, you go, you're gonna be seen at the traffic stop on camera. But we forget there's one who's always watching and he knows our heart. And when you come back, let's, okay, let's go to globalism because I wanna get to a more amoral. I'm gonna go to amoralism while my mind is there because we hear people say, follow your heart. The heart is what? deceitful. Without the training and being in the word of God, you will be deceived. You will be confused. You will compromise. Now, compromise can be good, but it can be deadly, right? This thing with globalism, we're now hearing this all over now. And I just posted on my Facebook an article that talks about how anti-religious it is, how ungodly it is, Where's an example in the Bible that tells us globalism's not a good idea? Babylon. Babylon. The what? Tower of Babel. Tower, Tower of Babel. When we, when we start building up an elite group, when we start building up someone as almighty and powerful, first off, we know it doesn't work. How many of you want the same policies that they're using in San Francisco or New York right here in rural Iowa? We know it doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. And there's a, here's part of the problem with the people who want this. They want to be a ruling class. Somebody will rule. Most of us won't, which means we will be the ruled, the slave and the free. And Bob McEwen's topic, right? What made America so great, I would tell you, look at the Declaration of Independence where God is mentioned four times. Not four gods, not ecumenical gods, one God, our God, four times. The freedom, the liberty, 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 
It set us on a chart and a course far different than any other nation. The rights are with the people. That was powerful. But that ruling class, they want the right people to have the power. See the difference? Get back to the amoralism. You can't decide, you can't tell me, I know what's best, moral relativism, whatever's right for you may not be right for me. Remind me what the name of that festival, what, what used to be at Iowa State, start with a V. Visha. They don't even have it anymore, do they? Why? It got too unruly, right? People started tossing over cop cars. They were unruly and they blamed it on drinking. Booze has been around a long time. You can't teach in your classrooms like they have done for generations that you can do whatever you want, moral relativism, that we don't have a God, that we won't be accountable, and wonder why they go off and do those things. And Visha is one of the best examples, I think. And that's not a dig at the Iowa State. I'm just telling you, you can't do that. In um, 2 Thessalonians 2.14, it says, it talks about the man of lawlessness. And I thought, you know, this is nothing we're doing right now is new. 2020, it stinks. To high heaven, everything we've dealt with this year, right? But it's not new. Ecclesiastes tells you there's nothing new under the sun. We've dealt through this. God has seen this time and again. Human nature, he knows he created us. But it's new to us. And if we're not in the word of God and grounded, then it can mess us up because it is all tied together. And we can blame the experts, and a lot of them are at fault. But you know what's in the middle of it? which is what happens with sin. When we put ourselves first, when we forget to put God first. And then the world wants to beat us up for it and tell us how we're not respectful and we're not kind and we're not thoughtful. And they want us to go with their little programs or their plan for the day, whatever it is that's trendy at that moment. But the truth is, this is timeless. And it doesn't change. Because one of those, in, glo in global, um, in autonomy, back when I wrote this, one of the tenets was that man must be allowed to express himself as, his, as he chooses. This was because the abortionist, the uh, uh, LGBTQ rights, they were saying we ought to be able to express ourselves. Now look today, you can't say certain words. You can't even use certain pronouns. They've, they're turning it again, remember? They're, how many of you heard you can't use that word anymore? Saturday Night Live just did a skit, and I do not watch Saturday Night Live, and I do not recommend it, but I was flipping through the channels one night, and it was a skit just in the last week or two, and somebody was saying a word, some, some you know, one our age, and all the younger people in the work environment or whatever it was was, you can't say that. You can't use that term. It's become that silly, has it not? And now, this person of this color can say that word. They say it in their music, but you can't. They're now deciding what your heart says, what your motives are. When the Bible tells you, only God can judge your heart. So I don't know about you, but I'd rather be at the mercy of an almighty, loving God than government. And government always grows. You will never see government go, I think we're gonna shrink this down. I think we're good, we're gonna close it up. They will always grow. Bigger government is better to them. Our founding fathers had an opposite idea of limited government. Do you remember that expression? Do you know how you get to limited government? You will either be ruled by something external or something internal. Robert Winthrop, who was a secretary of the, or speaker of the house, he was, uh, lived 1809 to I think 1890 something, speaker of the house, and he said, man will either be ruled by the Bible or by the bayonet. Our founding fathers gave us the liberty they did dependent on us having restraint, self-control. Christianity was a principle that was strongly woven in our governing documents. 
like it or not, because they knew what made us better Christians made us better citizens. Being responsible, being loving, being compassionate, as our pastor was talking about, there's a difference. We should have those programs, but they are your tithe dollar, not your tax dollar. Because you have accountability and a choice. As a Christian, I have a choice whether I give or whether I don't. And God will commend me, bless me for my generosity, or he will correct me for my greed. But if government takes it, it's coerced, and I no longer have the option, so I lose the blessing of a lesson. Right? And you mentioned it so well. If someone in this church needs help, you know who they are. You can get to them. By the time we fill out the paperwork, send it to the appropriate office, which they're all closed, by the way, get it to wherever it goes in D.C., the money comes back. Do you think it's in time to help? Not usually. There's fraud. There's a inefficiency, there's loss of the dollar. It falls upon us as Christians. The government needs to back out and we need to move back in as a church. We backed away. In the 50s and 60s when the New Deal came, we backed away. And uh, Joseph Farah from World Net Daily, I interviewed him about this in about 2002 or 2003. I thought it was gonna be women's lib why men fell away from the church. He said, no, it was a new deal. Because the men were responsible at that point for helping out if the widow needed help, a roof repair, a car, you know, a car, whatever it was. But when the government took over, the men weren't needed so much in the church. And they fell away. We need men to step back up. We need men to be leaders of their homes. And women, when they do, we need to let you to let them in a godly way, not in a lord over way. Not in a lording over way, but in a partnership way that God has designed. It is the family. That's where the strength comes from. So I've given you just kind of just an introduction, if you will, and I thank you. But I want you to know, I guess um, when Pastor and I were talking about this, I kind of wanted to talk to you last because it's so heavy on my heart right now. You mentioned Poland, and I'm so glad to get to be on that trip with you. When we were there, Huckabee, Governor Huckabee, took us to the park where the Pope was. And God, only God, there's a great book, a Pope, how is it, a Pope, a President, and a Prime Minister, I think is the name of the book. And all through the trip, they told us how God used Reagan, Thatcher, and the Pope. They were all friends. Reagan, they said, was too conservative to be, he was too patriotic to be a good leader. They said, uh, uh, Thatcher was too conservative. The Pope was too religious even for them, right? I think they'd all had assassination attacks. And yet, look how they came together and God used them. Because of their work, um, many feel that the Cold War ended without bullets and actual warfare. Because of their friendship, they were able to do things across the globe, which is not globalism. The Pope wanted to go back to Poland to speak. They didn't want him. Poland was in bondage. But because he was born there, they couldn't very well deny him. And so he spoke to them in a park, crowded. There were guards around or the police, whatever the deal was, it was not friendly. And many of them were at risk when they would leave. He had them singing hymns, but he gave the full out message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that our hope is his hymn, not in our government, but that you must act to have a government that you want. When you all want a garden, you don't pray and just look out the window. You head outdoors, you till the soil, you plant the seed, you deal with the plants, and then you harvest. We can't just pray, it's ours to do. And it was what Pope John Paul did that day that actually started the solidarity movement in Poland becoming free. But this is not just about freedom for a nation. Next Monday night, I will honor a veteran who was three years in a Palawan death camp. Three years a prisoner of war. They operated on him without anesthesia. We're here in America, and we think this has been a really crummy year. Surely, and I hear people say it, surely the end times are coming, you know, Jesus is gonna return. Because we're uncomfortable? You need to shed that notion right away. 
And when I hear people say, I've read the end of the book, and he wins. Well, do you? Because I don't see anywhere where it says, sit on the bench and wait. It says, be busy and occupy. And if you really thought the coming of the Lord was coming anytime soon, would you be here or would you be calling your relatives, going door to door and saying, you got to know this is happening, right? So these worldviews, we're a mess. Oh, I forgot, I forgot the one part. This is kind of integral to my spider web. We've allowed this to take place from our schools, from our government, from all these places for so long. My husband calls it a Christianized safety net. You used to be able to trust the media. Do you anymore? You used to be able to trust God, a government, because God was at the helm of it. Do you anymore? Used to feel comfortable with our schools. Do we anymore? Did you ever think there would be a day when people would come out against your police officers? and law enforcement. But they are. Because we weren't teaching the truth of God's word, the daily standards, and talking about daily issues. We've got to bring it home to the issues, whether it's abortion, immigration, education, welfare, whatever it is. If God expects you to live through it, he's directed you how to do it somewhere in his word. And I have a great book called Well Versed by Jim Garlow. I've got them at my cost. I'll sell them to you. You let me know. I'll bring you one to church. It's very well written, easily re readable, but it just helps you talk to your neighbors. Stand your ground. Why is this important? Because you better know the Word of God first, right? Our Constitution came out of the Word of God. It is not more powerful. It does not supersede the Word of God. You need to know that. Islam believes Sri La is more powerful than our Constitution and I won't get into that today, but one brings freedom and liberty, and you see what the other brings. Right? We have got to get back to the Word, and not just reading it, but living it. Unity. Do you hear people talk about unity? I don't like that word. I like the idea, but if we're in obedience, there will be unity. You can be in unity in lockstep and headed the wrong direction. Ask Hitler. There'll be a lot of reasons you can have unity. Compulsion, coercion, deceit, confusion, but obedience, you will be in right step. And you will have liberty and you will have freedom. Like the tree planted by the water. Politics, whatever it is, there's a lot to argue about. We argue about religion, we argue about that faith versus this faith versus that faith. Ravi Zacharias, who passed away, I think, this year, great man, would tell you, believing in Jesus Christ as your personal savior, that's the key, right? What that professor told my son wasn't important. I think that's the one thing we need to argue about. The rest I will try and have a conversation, not a confrontation, because we don't get anywhere that way. But I'm asking you as we head into the holidays, some of you have family members who aren't where they should be spiritually. You need to pray first, pray always, but you don't stay silent. There's too much at stake. And you just don't know when life is going to change and when it will end for someone you love without warning. That's why I do what I do. That's why I'm here with you today. That's why I'm thankful to get to be here and I'm thankful to have you as a pastor willing to teach us this and willing to risk making somebody mad to tell them the truth. We are in a battle, friends. It's ugly and it's more mired than I remember it in years past, but here's the beauty. America was born out of a crisis. We were in a battle then too. Next Monday, we're celebrating that veterans event. It is the anniversary of when Cornwallis surrendered to Washington at um, Yorktown, effectively gave us our nation. It was ordinary men and women who stood the battle. We didn't have a militia. We weren't even a country yet. Ordinary men and women, pastors, the Black Robe Regiment, stood up and said, enough, we're going to stand on the righteousness of an almighty God 
and liberty and gave us a nation. And I would say to you, we are at this point in America today where it's our turn to stand up and save a nation, right? I'm not just talking politically. We look at elections, God looks at eternity. I vote so that I can help my kids find eternity and they can share the truth of eternity with their kids without repercussion. Esther, everybody likes to throw that verse at us for such a time as this. And I always cringe because read the first part of that verse. If you don't, help may come, but it may be too late for your people. God is the one who sets up nations and he takes them down. Jeremiah 7, 18, 7, 8, 9, and 10. It's a very clear picture. And it will be in his timeline. But he put each of you here, right now, in America, in Des Moines, Iowa, for whatever purpose. And he's given you a mission, a purpose, a gift, and a goal. And I'm asking you to be on your knees and ask him what it is and how you use it for this church, for this community for this country. Thank you so much for being here today.